Casey talked about the, really the attack we feel that is on this church um, and it's on many of us, and anxiety and pressure and, and restlessness. Uh, and I think that song really just speaks to the, the length that God will go uh, to pursue us in love um, and that he is fighting to dispel the lies that oftentimes fill our minds uh, and cause us to believe things that aren't true of the Lord. Uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm really grateful for the truth of scripture and that God fights for us and doesn't leave us on our own um, to fight for ourselves, but that he, he actively stands and fights for us. Um, one of my favorite verses that, uh, that I've just really grown to love is Romans 15, verse 7. Man, and my apologies for this. They, they tell me it's not the microphone, it's the it's a user error, so I'm, I'm sorry for the, the poppiness of it. Uh, maybe one day I'll figure that out. But Romans 15, verse 7, um, by far one of my favorite verses it says, therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. If, if you're here today and you're a Christian, you've put your faith in Christ and you follow him, then you have been welcomed into the family of God. You once were an outsider and Jesus has welcomed you into his family, into a relationship with him. And my hope and my prayer today for you is that you'll be reminded by the spirit that you were an outsider and that Christ has done everything to bring you in. And then if you're, if you're not a Christian today, the invitation is given. That there is an open seat at the table for you and Jesus says, come on. Come sit and eat and drink with me. And my prayer and my hope for you today is that you will hear that invitation from Jesus and that you will receive the invitation to follow him and to have a relationship uh, with Jesus Christ. Last year, we talked about Simeon and Anna in Luke chapter two. They had been waiting and waiting and waiting, hundreds and hundreds of years that the promised Messiah would come and they were waiting and watching. They were actively positioning themselves to receive the promise of God. So often we miss out on what God has to say for us because we don't actively position ourselves to hear from him. Like we're great at positioning ourselves to hear and receive other things and other people's voices and other forms of media and, and whatever, but we, we just struggle to position ourselves to hear from God and to wait for him. But Simeon and Anna, they were, they were waiting. They were looking for something better. And in an instant, they found everything they were looking for. And what I love about their story is it wasn't in a change of circumstances. So often what we think will be better is a change of circumstances. If just this changes or this person loves me or I get this job or this thing works out, then I will be happy. But the problem is it's not a change of circumstances that will satisfy us. Nothing else can carry the weight of our hearts. You see, what changed was that Jesus entered the scene and they knew that's what they were looking for. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us shows up and changes everything for them. The, uh, the story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is about Jesus. In the Old Testament, we see it looking forward, pointing to Jesus, the promise of the coming Messiah. And then in the, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's the story, it's the life of Jesus. And then Acts through Revelation is talking about how we live in response to who Jesus is. So everything in the Bible is about Jesus, pointing to him, telling of him, or showing us how to live in response to Jesus. Jesus changes everything, everything. Our, our, our entire culture, our entire world, whether, whether you follow Jesus or not, you cannot deny that Jesus has changed everything. Our calendar system has flipped, right? Because of this person, Jesus. So who is Jesus? Like, who is this person? What, what has he done? What has he come to do that, that everything would revolve around him? So many people, they were expecting and they were trusting that, a, that the coming one, the Messiah, would come. And they were expecting this royal king, right? Th th this, this powerful, majestic king. And while Jesus was the king of kings, he was not the king that many expected. He was the one that would take the posture of a servant and would wash the feet of those who would sin against him. Many were expecting this powerful figure, 
this person of glory and prestige to come into town and to be the one that would set people free. And while Jesus has all power and all glory, what I think marks him most is his humility. That he was willing to leave all that behind for our good. So Jesus, he, he came, and, and, and then and today, we oftentimes have a, a different picture of who Jesus is. Like, it's so easy, right, to, to think, like, this is who Jesus is. This is what Jesus would do. This is what Jesus would say. And, and we just miss who Jesus really is. Well, one of the things that, um, that I, I've come to learn about Jesus, and I, I just overlooked it, I think, for the longest time, comes from Luke chapter 7. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 7. So it's the, third, um, it's the third book of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Luke chapter 7. If you don't own a Bible, uh, there's some on a table right outside that door, and, and we would just love for you to have one. And if you've got a neighbor or a friend or a roommate that doesn't have one, take it and give it to them. Like, we will always replace Bibles. We have no problem giving those away. Um, and so please, take a Bible. But um, let me also encourage you, uh, I, I know we live in a day uh, of technology, and, and that's like, that's okay. That's not a bad thing necessarily. Um, but let me, this is pure preference. Let me challenge you, bring a paper Bible. Only because I think our culture is so easily distracted and so easily connected to these things that we call phones or whatever tablets that I, I just think maybe it would be good for our souls to leave it away for a bit. So just no shame, no guilt. If you want to bring your phone next week, bring your phone. It's just a thought. I've just been wrestling with how do we detach from these things more often because they seem to have a control on us more than anything. Um, so just a thought. Uh, anyways, we don't, have to, we don't have to dwell there. Luke chapter 7. And this is, this is something that I just, I overlooked. I never really considered it. Um, I just kind of thought it was like a, a detail in the context of what was happening. But it says so much about who Jesus is. Luke chapter 7, verse 34. Luke chapter 7, verse 34. The Son of Man, that's another name for Jesus given in Daniel chapter 7. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking. And you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus has come eating and drinking. For all the reasons that we know Jesus came, Jesus came to seek and to save, Jesus came to heal, Jesus came to serve, Jesus came to glorify the Father, Jesus came to honor God, all these things that were like, this is what Jesus came to do. Jesus also came to eat and to drink. He came eating and drinking. Why, why is this so important? Like why when we're talking about the coming of Jesus, the celebration of Jesus, why would we spend any time talking about the fact that Jesus came eating and drinking? And the reason is because it tells us that more than power or position, Jesus was concerned with people. Like more, more than power and position, Jesus was concerned with people. More than like building this, this religion and this just powerful religious institution, Jesus was creating context, tables where he can sit in relationship with people. Jesus is interested in people and he's interested in the ones that most overlook, the most people overlook. He's interested in the sinners and the tax collectors. He's a, a friend, a relational friend to those that most people walk away from. That's what's so significant about this verse is that there's always an open seat at the table with Jesus. I, I don't know how, what you came in here with. I don't know how you view Jesus. I don't know what you're, you're thinking about yourself. But just know that Jesus is a friend to all. And there's an invitation to come and to sit with him. I want to pray and ask that God would um, speak to us through this about who Jesus is and that um, every one of us would hear the voice of God. So would you, would you pray with me for a second? And would you start, would you ask God yourself in your own mind and heart to speak to you and to block out distractions so that you can hear his voice? And then if you would be so kind, would you ask God to speak through me, that it would not be my words or my intellect or anything that, that is speaking, but it will be the words of God through me.
God, if we just want to get together and read a book and hear people talk, we can do that anywhere at any time. God, we're here because we believe you are real and that your words matter more than any other words. And so, God, we want to hear from you. Speak to us today. Open our eyes to this Jesus, the friend of sinners and tax collectors, the one who comes to eat and to drink with us. That we would love you more, and in response, we would love others in the way that you have loved us. It's in Christ we pray. Amen. One of the scariest places, who, who likes scary movies or like haunted houses type thing? I'm just curious. That's just a, like a personality. Okay, uh, cool. All right, we'll talk later. Like, it's, I just wonder if there's something, I don't know. Um, I'm not a, like, I don't like scary things. Uh, it's just not for me. But one of the scariest places I believe on the face of the planet, a middle school or a high school cafeteria. See, look, some of you are like, yep, yep, I'm traumatized from that. It's just a terrifying place to be. There's so much like just posturing and trying to find position and insecurity. And it's like, you know, you're just trying to find your spot, right? Like you just want to know you've got a seat at the table. You don't want to be left out on the outside looking in. You don't want to be like the person kind of hovering, like trying to work your way in between friends because then everybody knows like, all right, this person doesn't really fit here. It's just a terrifying scene, right? There's so much comfort in knowing I've got a spot. Like I, I, I've got a, a group of friends. I've got a table that I belong to. I don't have to wonder. I don't have to hope. I don't have to try to work my way in. There's so much comfort in that, right? Right, Michaela? I'm looking at Michaela. She knows, right? She's in middle school. Like there's so much comfort in knowing that you've got a seat at the table. Now, I remember as a high school pastor when like a few days before the semester, I didn't even know when schedules would come out, but whenever schedules would come out for the next semester, man, tweets would start going off like, hey, what's your schedule? What lunch do you have? Because people are trying to figure out who they're going to sit with at lunch before they ever have to go to that first lunch because you don't want to walk in there and be like, I don't know where I'm going. Like, do I have any friends here? I'm going to be sitting by myself. Nobody wants to do that. Right? I would go to the lunches sometimes as a pastor. I was intimidated walking into that place. Like, it was just awful. And so I walked in one day, and I see some of my students, uh, like a handful of them, like a dozen or so, right? And I walk up to one of my buddies, Aiden, and he's sitting at this table of people that I'd never seen before, right? And so I'm like, hey, are these your, are these your school buddies? Because, you know, so often you have your church friends and you have your school friends and whatnot. It's like, so are these your school friends? And he's like, eh, you know, not really, kind of. I'm like, but... And at a point, I was like, why aren't you sitting with, with Zach? Like, he, some of his buddies from community group were in the same lunch at a different table. I could see them. And I was like, why, why aren't you? And he was like, oh, you know, just on the first day, this is where I sat. And I don't, I don't know if there's a seat over there. He would rather sit with people that he was just like casually acquaintances with than run the risk of not having a seat at another table. Right, like that's, and I noticed that was just true. Once people found their seats, they didn't change the rest of the semester. Like that was it. Because they didn't want to go through the fear of not having a spot, of not belonging, of being alone, of being left out, because it's traumatizing. And even more so, because that's how we're wired, that we need to belong. Nobody I don't care how confident and secure you are in yourself. Nobody wants to feel alone. Nobody wants to feel like they're an outsider. Nobody wants to feel like they're not wanted, that they're not desired, that they're not loved. And even more so, we want to know. We, we have to have a place where we can drop all of our facades and all of our posturing and all of our acting and we can truly be seen for who we are and still wanted. All of us want that. Every single one of us want the security and the comfort to know that whatever comes, I know I belong here. Whatever happens in the future, I know I'm loved here. Whatever changes come, I know that I have a seat here, right? Every one of us, right? Little, little, maybe a little something here. Maybe it's just me. Okay, cool, I see some head nods. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, yes, because that's, that's how God's made us. That's how God has wired us. When, when you come into this church, you wanna know that you're seen and that you're known. You wanna know that people welcome you and accept you. I can't tell you the number of people I've talked to that have left the church because they felt like they were unwanted. And honestly, it was true so often. 
that no one noticed. They stopped coming, and it was two, three, four months later, and you run into the grocery store, and you're like, oh, I haven't seen you in a while. It's like, it's because I haven't been in three months. But no one notices, because we want to know that we're seen. Right? That's why we join clubs, sororities, fraternities, gyms. We go to bars. We go, we, we go on dates. We, we, we're create, we have to have it. We have to have that place of acceptance and belonging and love, no matter who we are. It's how God made us, every single one of us. And that's why this little verse is so key, that Jesus came eating and drinking, that he was a friend to sinners and tax collectors, because it tells us that Jesus cares about creating a place for us to belong. That Jesus is interested in a relationship with you and with me, with anyone and everyone, that there's an invitation to come and to sit at the table with Jesus. A real seat, a place of belonging. We all want it. We desire it in the depths of our souls. And Jesus has come to give it. To sit down. I, I mean, eating and drinking, right? Like, what's so significant about it? Everybody does that. All right, everybody has to eat and drink somewhere, right? You, gotta, you got to. But what it really means is that it's an invitation of friendship. It's an invitation of acceptance. It's an invitation of, hey, hey you can be a part of my life. I will invite you into my life. You don't eat with people that you, you don't have a relationship or you don't want a relationship with. I mean, unless you're just forced to, but then everybody knows you're not really eating with them. You eat with people because they're your people or you want them to be your people, right? And so when Jesus comes eating and drinking, it's Jesus extending an invitation of friendship. It's Jesus welcoming people into his life. It's Jesus having relationships with people, a place of belonging. He could have just been the, the powerful figure, He's God. He could do whatever he wanted, right? He could have just rode in and dominated, just done whatever he wanted. But he comes and he eats and he drinks. He sits down and he looks people in the eye and he talks and he laughs and he cries and he feels and he welcomes people into his life the same way that we want to be welcomed. Jesus, he came eating and drinking, a friend of sinners and tax collectors. And that's what I think That's what I think is so amazing about this Jesus. Is that he, he, wants, he, wants, to, he wants a relationship with me. He, he, doesn't just, he doesn't just want me to go through some motions. He doesn't just want me to like come to, come to church or go, you know, he, he wants me to, he wants to know me. How do you see Jesus? Do you see him as this relational loving friend? Yes, he is king and he is holy and he is righteous and he is also friend. We forget sometimes that the most important thing we can do is commune with Jesus. It's to sit and talk with him. What I think impresses me more than anything is not that Jesus came and ate and drank, but, but who he ate and drank with. Right, who he ate and drank with, that he was a, a friend of, of sinners and tax collectors. And not that he just spent a little bit of time with them, like he spent enough time with them that they called him a glutton and a drunk. A glutton is someone who eats too much. A drunk is someone who drinks too much. So he spent enough time socially relating with people that others on the outside were like, that dude, all he does is eat and drink. He's a glutton and a drunkard. Like Jesus was about spending time with people. And what's amazing is who he spent time with that he spent time with those that most of us would probably overlook and move away from, that that's who Jesus moved towards. There, there's two stories that I just want to look at um, briefly that I think demonstrate this incredibly well. Uh, one is in Luke 7 here, and then the next one we'll turn back a couple pages in Luke 5. But let's, let's go here first in Luke chapter 7. In verse 36, it says, One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. 
So first off, a Pharisee is, is the religious elite of the town. So like everybody knew who the Pharisees were. They, they were leaders in a community. They, they knew the Bible frontwards and backwards. They had the first five books of the Old Testament memorized by the time they were a teenager. Like that's impressive, right? I've got maybe Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then I start to struggle, right? They had the first five books of the Old Testament. So they knew their stuff. They obeyed the law better than anybody. They were respected. They were revered. They were feared, right? And so those who the Pharisees are, and they invite Jesus to come eat with them. And Jesus is like, okay, let's eat. Let's go hang out. And what's unique about the tables and the, the way that it was set up in a first century home, especially a, a prominent, more well-to-do home, is that you oftentimes, there was a table outside. So just imagine like a, a restaurant here with kind of the patio and you can just like walk down the street and there's, you know, the patio right there. So that's what's happening. There's a table kind of in the courtyard area and they didn't have chairs. They, they would kind of just lean in um, on an elbow uh, and so their feet would kind of be behind them a little bit and that's how they, they sat at a table. Seems incredibly uncomfortable to me, but I guess if that's all you knew, it'd be fine, right? So that's how, that's the scene. They're at this table, this outdoor courtyard and they're just kind of leaning in like this with their feet behind them, eating, talking, you know, sharing life together. Verse 37, and behold, what we say about the word behold? It's a divine highlighter right? It, boom, lock in here. Something significant is happening. Behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner. Translation, prostitute. A woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Get, get the picture again. Jesus, a, a devout Jew, perfect, sinless, right? So he's, he, he's, not your, he's not your shady character, right? So you get Jesus at, at, at a dinner party with all these other religiously elite people. And, and they're just eating, right? And then this woman comes up from behind Jesus and bends down and drops this oil on his feet and is just sobbing uncontrollably. And she's, she's wiping his feet clean with her hair. And everybody knows who she is. You just have to look at her. You know how she's dressed. You, you know what she's about. And yet she's kissing his feet. Like talk about awkward. Imagine, like what, what do you do when, how do you respond in that situation? Right? When, when someone who wasn't even invited, someone who you've never really associated with, unless it's in secret and you hope for sure nobody knows, right? And, and she comes up and she bends down and just starts kissing his feet. Are you kidding me? Like, that happens? She's so desperate for belonging. So desperate for acceptance and love that she is willing to come to a dinner party she was never invited to. She is willing to publicly embarrass and throw herself at the feet of Jesus, the friend of sinners, hoping that he won't reject her. Most people around her, you can tell from even the, the attitude of Simon, they, they would just use her and lose her, right? Like, she didn't have value. She was just an object. I mean, Simon, he didn't even dignify. He just said, who and what sort of woman this is. He, he just objectified her, but not Jesus. We see down in verse 48, he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who can even forgive sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The peace that she is longing for, the acceptance and belonging that this woman desires is found with Jesus. He welcomes her in to the table with him. 
Where, where Simon and the others just saw a prostitute, Jesus sees a person. Where they just saw a problem, Jesus sees a person. Where they see someone to push away and keep at arm's length, Jesus sees someone to pull close and to welcome in. Where they would just call her a whore, Jesus calls her a daughter. This is the welcoming love of Jesus. Now, I know that we all struggle with shame and guilt at times. It may be weighing on your shoulders right here today. And here's what you need to know. That's not what Jesus looks at. Jesus is not focused on your problems. He's focused on you. Jesus does not keep you away because of your shame. He brings you in to wash you clean. So I don't know what your history is. I don't know what three years from now will hold. But just know that with Jesus, you are always welcomed to the table to come and to sit and to explore and to give your life in faith to follow Jesus. There's welcoming and love with Christ. So now turn back to Luke chapter 5. A couple pages to the left there. We see another, another story. Oh dear. Hold on. right there. All right, Luke chapter 5, verse 27. So Jesus is leaving uh, the miracle where he heals a paralytic, right? Where if you look back up into verse 26, he's healed someone who's never walked before in his life. And, and people are saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. And Jesus is like, hold on, we're just about to get started. Let's go. Verse 27, after this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. So Jesus is walking along and he sees Levi, a tax collector. Now, what we have to know is historically, tax collectors in a Jewish culture were hated. Absolutely the lowest of low of low, scum of the earth, despised by other Jews. And here's why they betrayed their own people to make themselves rich. So Rome had taken over, and there was these, these few that said, hey, I, I'll follow suit, Rome. I'll go collect taxes for you. And with eyes wide open, they willingly stole from their neighbors and their family in order to get rich. So Rome says, hey, we're going to tax this family $100. And Levi, the tax collector, walks up, and he's like, hey, your taxes are due. It's $200. And so they've got to pay the 200, 100 goes to Rome, Levi's pocketing the other 100. Then he goes to the next neighbor's house, hey, your taxes are due, 200 bucks. 100 bucks goes to Rome, $100 he, he taxes. And everybody knew that they were being stolen from, but they had the power of Rome backing them, and so they couldn't do anything. And so they were absolutely hated. Like everybody would have been okay with them never waking up one morning. It would have been all right. And so Jesus sees Levi, and he heads towards him. And you can imagine, as they're all watching this, they're like, okay, what's, what's Jesus going to do? Like, is he going to walk up there and just, like, smack him in the face and be like, shame on you. You're an insult to your family and your friends. Right? Like, that's what, that's what would be expected because they were so hated. Jesus' family was stolen from by these people. They were Jews. They had to pay taxes. So it would make sense if that's what Jesus did. But instead, Jesus walks towards Levi, intentionally pursues him and says, hey, dude, come be one of my boys. Like, leave all this. Let's go. Let's hang out. He doesn't even address it. He doesn't even address his past sins. He just says, hey, leave all that behind. Let's go. Come be one of my guys. Come be one of my friends. The, the people that everyone else moved away from, Jesus intentionally walked towards. Y'all, that is earth shattering. The people that everybody else looked at and walked away from, Jesus went the other direction and moved towards them. 
He welcomes Levi in. He invites him into a relationship. And then it gets better, right? Verse 29, Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors. Like, so all of these shady, no good, it'd be great if you were dead people are all gathered together in one party. Levi's throwing this epic tax collector party. And there, others reclining at the table with him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Right? It's one thing if Jesus is going to go hang out with Levi, but now he's going to go hang out with all of them like they're friends or something. Like you're going to go hang out with these people that nobody likes, like they're your buddies. Are you kidding me? And Jesus says, yep, that's where I'm going. Those are my people. You can just imagine the Pharisees saying, they're, they're not one of us. They don't belong with us. They don't behave like we behave. Do you know their morals? Do you know what they do? Like, don't you know that they're bad people? And Jesus is like, yep. Yep, but they belong with me. They don't have to clean up their behavior first. I'm going to go to them, and we're going to be friends. And Jesus spent a lot of time moving towards people, not expecting them to clean up their behavior first, but inviting them to believe and trusting that their behavior would follow. That's a huge difference in how we treat people. He did not expect them to clean up their behavior first but invited them to believe and trusted that their behavior would follow. Huge difference in how we treat people. Jesus moves near to those intentionally. It's one thing in the first scene in Luke 7, right, where this woman comes to him. Like, it would be rude, kind of be like, all right, go away. So I get that. But in this one, he didn't have to talk to Levi. Levi wasn't coming to him. Instead, Jesus chose to go to Levi. The humility it takes to intentionally pursue people in love who are not pursuing you in love, that'll change the world. It'll straight up change the world. To pursue people in love who are not pursuing you. And that's what Jesus does. You've heard us, man, you've just heard us talk about this before. It's the table that Jesus sat at. If you just imagine this table where everybody that Jesus hung out with was invited, and you just imagine who would be at that table with him? Like who would be eating in community with Jesus? So just in these two stories, you've got, you've got a prostitute who comes in, in, in humility and shame. At the same party, you've got Pharisees, the religious elite. In Luke 5, you've got the tax collectors and the drunks. You've got Luke, the author of this book, a doctor. You've got John and Peter, blue-collar fishermen, a little rough around the edges. You've got Thomas, the questioner, the doubter of Jesus, even after he resurrected, he's doubting. You've got Bartimaeus, the blind beggar. Nicodemus, the Pharisee, seeking Jesus in secret. You've got the lepers who Jesus healed. You've got Paul, the murderer of Christians. Man, you've got all kinds of people, the sick and the healthy, the rich and the poor, the good and the bad, and they're all invited to the table with Jesus. What's incredible about that? I feel like I could fit in with that crowd. I feel like Jesus' love and invitation is so wide that he'll take me. And then he's not going to expect me to clean up my behavior before I can belong with him. But that he's going to love me and invite me and that he'll transform me along the way. The table of Jesus. John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We oftentimes don't read 17 as much. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. I mean, Jesus knew we were sinners. He knew what he was getting into, and yet he still came, not to condemn us, but to free us from our sins and to welcome us in to a relationship with him, a friendship with him. 
that through his death, our sins could be forgiven, and through his resurrection, we can live today and forever at the table with Jesus. That's why he came. Eating and drinking to invite us into a relationship with him. I trust Christ and I follow Jesus, not because I have all my questions answered. I'm a questioner, I'm a doubter. But I trust Christ because that's the only one that I would make it in with. Every other religion expects me to measure up and I'm just not good enough. Bottom line. But Jesus said he'll measure up for me and by faith I can freely follow him and let him change my life. That's why I believe that Jesus is true. I won't measure up anywhere else. Have you received this invitation? Have you trusted Christ? Have you received his invitation to come to the table, to eat with him? It starts there. It changes everything. Let me ask you another question. If you're a Christian, who's at your table? What does your table look like? Your literal table, but also just figuratively your life. You see, the Pharisees had a table, and in order to eat at the table with the Pharisees, you had to talk like them, you had to behave like them, you had to dress like them, you, you kind of had to be like them. Jesus had a table, and man, it didn't matter. The invitation was given to everybody, anyone and everyone, come eat, come with me. Which table does your life more look like? Do you expect people to kind of dress like you, talk like you, behave like you in order to have entrance into your life? Or does your table look more like Jesus, where anyone and everyone can have a seat? And not only that you're going to welcome them in, but that you're going to intentionally pursue them and invite those in. Who's at your table? What does it look like? I think more often than not, people don't have a problem with Jesus. People have a problem with the people who say they follow Jesus but live nothing like him. Amen. Amen. May we see that, that the outsiders, the sinners, the tax collectors, they were drawn to Jesus. That's not what's happening today in our world. People aren't drawn to Christians into the church. They're trying to get away as fast as possible. But I don't think the problem's with Jesus. I think the problem's more often with us. That we don't live like Jesus lived. We don't pursue people that are different than us and invite them into our lives. We don't truly welcome people in to have a seat at the table with us. We want our tables to look nice and clean and put together and that everybody's just kind of like us because it's easier and it's more comfortable and we don't have to work as hard. Who's at your table? Who's not at your table? Is there anybody you're intentionally leaving out? Is there anybody in your world that you, you intentionally try to keep at arm's length where Jesus would pull them close? We will never have a table like Jesus. We will never be a church that has a table like Jesus until we first realize that we are the outsider. And we didn't deserve a seat at the table with Jesus. We weren't good enough. And yet Jesus pursued us. We have to realize, I have to realize that I am Levi. That we, we are the woman in Luke 7. And we don't deserve to be at his table, yet he welcomes us in. He invites us to trust and to follow him and to give our lives to him. We will never be this until we realize that first. Until we truly believe that it's by grace alone that we have a seat at the table with the Lord. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. That verse was not just for the people in Rome. That verse is not just for the person to your right or to your left. That verse is for you. 
Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. You want to change the world? Welcome people into your life. Eat with them. Talk with them. Pursue the outsider. Pursue people that are different than you. Not, not because you have to, but because that's what Jesus first did for you. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. I think we'll start to see the world around us changed. Have you received the invitation to sit at the table with Jesus? And if you have, are you inviting and welcoming people in to your table the same way that Jesus did? Anyone and everyone's invited. Come sit, eat, let's talk. Let's see who this Jesus is who can change our lives. Let's pray together. Hebrews 4 says the word of God is living and active. That these are God's words and they're, they're meant to, to move us. That we're meant to respond to what God tells us. And so we just want to take some time to respond to whatever it is that he may be saying to you right now. So would you listen to him? Would you listen for his voice? And would you commit in your heart to respond however God is prompting you to respond to his words?